Hello and welcome to Searching for Reality. Uh, we're in Module 8 now, and we're looking at uh, the British empirical thinkers, uh, David Hume and John Locke in particular. And then we'll, we'll move tentatively over to the French Enlightenment. Uh, these two sort of philosophical periods coexist. There's a bit of overlap, but generally speaking, they're occurring at roughly the same time. As a matter of fact, uh, David Hume was good friends with some of the French Enlightenment thinkers that we will talk about. Now, before I start, I just want to remind you that uh, the second essay is due on the 29th of November, which is a Sunday, uh, 2020, of course. And I know it sounds like it's kind of early, but November seems to be a, a month that's about three days long because we've got lots of things that have just finished, things that are coming up. So what I'd like you to do is to consider uh, your next paper, uh, it would be the second essay. Uh, so by the end of this week, what I'd like you to consider are the following things. Um, take a look at some of the topics, and they are buried into the submission box. Uh, if you go to the submission box, of course, and click on it, you'll see a list of topics. The structure is the same, roughly around 1,200 words. Um, some of you uh, wrote reasonably good papers, but were a little bit uh, shy of the, the minimum amount, which is around 1,000. So try to make sure that you pick a topic that isn't too huge nor too uh, too small that will allow you to write around 1,000 to 1,200 words. So take a look at the topics, uh, pick one that you would like to write on, and just kind of give it some thought. And when you're thinking about it, what I'd like you to do is to consider a thesis, like a particular idea that you wish to explore in a little bit more detail. Uh, then find and evaluate at least three sources, because this is still a research paper. And I would like you to consider some sources that you will use for, to write your paper. And not only that, those sources should support your thesis in some way. Uh, clearly, you don't want to find a, a really good article, but it contradicts your main idea. That's not going to be very useful. And that's what I mean by evaluating it. First of all, find them. And then secondly, just sort of briefly read through them or read through the abstract and see whether what they have to offer is going to benefit your thesis. So look at those, think about it, and think about whether those uh, those secondary sources will uh, allow you to develop your idea further. Now, as you're doing this, um, think of po possible objections, uh, some sort of contradictory positions or alternative positions that could be raised in your paper, and then you can address those. And that is just basically part of sort of uh, a preemptive strike, we'll call it, when it comes to presenting an idea that you wish to discuss in your paper. Think of some objections and then build them right into your into your comments. And then uh, also to uh, figure out what you'd like to do in terms of breaking it uh, down into sections. And again, it sounds like this is going to be a 25 page paper. It's not. It shouldn't be more than about five pages maximum. And so the sections of your paper are basically, first of all, your introduction, right? Then your conclusion. Uh, you want to set up your argument where whatever it is that you're choosing to discuss, you can uh, outline it carefully and logically and are able to do that in a way that you can sort of basically, if you want to be sort of crass about it, you're just going to connect the dots, right? So lay out those dots, right? Lay out those, uh, those individual ideas and figure out how you're going to work your way towards them. So... Again, don't panic. It's not due until the 29th of November. Now, that gives me a chance to read them because remember, our last day period for me, uh, well, our last day together, but my last day for my marks is the 18th of December. So I want to have a chance to be able to read these properly, give them the, the time and attention they deserve, and give you a good mark because it will also be at that point between the 29th and the, the end of uh, December, the term, there'll be uh, quiz three and four. I'm putting these together right now. So there'll be a fair bit going on. And that's what I mean when I say November seems to fly by because there's just so many things that are going on. So for this week, I said we're going to look at the British empiricists and we're going to discuss John Locke and David Hume. Hume a little bit less than Locke. Locke seems to be sort of the more important or the more common, commonly known empirical uh, thinker. Uh, but as you can see, there is a, no, there's really not a lot of overlap, but they do uh, coincide logically and chronologically, uh, certainly in, in England, because you've got Thomas Hobbes, then you've got John Locke, and then you've got George Berkeley and David Hume. But we'll take a look primarily at Locke in this case here. Now, uh, Locke and Hume were what? They were empiricists. Now, what is, what is an empiricist? 
An empiricist is someone who has uh, believes that knowledge comes from sense experience. Obviously lived experience, but sense experience in particular. Uh, compare that to rationalists. Rationalists would be people like Spinoza that we talked about last week, or Descartes the, year, uh, the week before. Uh, these rationalists believed that rather than experience being the foundation of knowledge, reason was the foundation of knowledge. And we could work out all the contradictions in our ideas just simply by thinking them through, right? So those, those are the main differences between empiricists who believe that knowledge comes from sense experience or begins there as a foundation, and rationalists who believe that it comes from reason. So, as I mentioned, Spinoza and Descartes were rationalists, right? For them, the ground or the foundation of knowledge, right, is reason. And their belief is that without pure reason, now this is reason not as a source, but as a tool, because this, when you say that someone is being reasonable, right, they're thinking about something, they're working through an idea. So remember here, reason is a, is a tool by which we can then uh, gain knowledge. So without pure reason, we would not have any knowledge at all. That's the way that Descartes and Spinoza and other rationalists view the world. Um, because we used, we need to use our cogito, right? Our knowledge. And so if that's the case, uh, any kind of ideas need to be built on this solid foundation of reason. Now, uh, Descartes, right? For him, knowledge was uh, premised on the, on the cogito, right? I think, therefore I am. Spinoza, uh, he wrote his, uh, wrote other things, but really his most famous piece is Ethics Demonstrated in Geometrical Order which attempts to provide these logical proofs. Now, logical proofs, not in terms of empirical data, although there is empiric empirical ideas in it, because he does talk about nature and how God is in nature, nature is in God, but he takes it much further. He uses that and extrapolates these further ideas in a logical fashion, in this kind of geometrical fashion. So he ultimately use, uses reason to divine the idea that God exists because nature exists. That's essentially what he's doing. Now, the first really important uh, British empiricist is our boy Francis Bacon, right? You could call him the first real scientist in the modern sense of the word. Now, Bacon isn't really discussed a whole lot, but he should be because he is the person that is uh, alleged to have come up with what we now call still the scientific method, right? The scientific method is observation and experimentation. And you do this under controlled conditions. So you can re pre recreate the same conditions time and again to verify a hypothesis you may have about the world. So the scientific method combines both empirical sense data and thinking about it, right? So it's a combination of empiricism and rationalism, but in a way that is different than what's different is this notion of observing and experimenting. And you continually do it under these con control conditions. And that is the way in which you understand the world. And you, you are trying to get some level of consistency. You have a hypothesis and you are able to prove it conclusively in the natural world using this method. And you do this in such a way that you're able to divine knowledge in a way that is consistent because it's consistent according to a pattern that you're you are seeing and we'll talk about this a little bit more very briefly but this is what the scientific method is it's inductive and what is happening is you're starting with a single idea and you move towards a general premise and so that is that is uh there's induction and deduction right that's induction is a scientific method deduction is the way in which uh, Descartes is working, right? Deduces, takes away, right? Remember, he sat there in his, by his fireplace in the 1600s, warming his feet and just thinking. And he just deduced everything, ripped, stripped away everything that could be doubted to find the only thing that he knew absolutely for sure was that I think, therefore I am. But notice the way that phrase is written. I think is primary. That is the foundational idea. No matter what, even if I'm doubting, I'm still thinking. Therefore, cogito exists. I think, therefore I am. As a result of my existence, I or my of my thoughts, I exist. Now, deduction is the scientific, uh, uh, sorry, uh, induction is a scientific method. But there you have the possibility of something being true. 
And so it's not, it's not um, absolutely correct. Uh, there, there are no absolutes in science. There's consistency, hopefully, based on these patterns that we, uh, we identify. But beyond that, it becomes rather difficult to say absolutely for sure. And this is what, uh, you know, some kind of deductive reasoning is alleged to be able to do because we're basing it on reason as opposed to Bacon's scientific method where we are observing and experimenting and following through a hypothesis and seeing how consistent that pattern is that, that allows us to have the same results over and over again. So that is really the scientific method that Francis Bacon is uh, presenting to us. And what's important is when we look at the two types, you know, both, both have got good and bad points. Now, uh, deduction, which is Descartes' uh, method. Okay. It works if the premises are true. So deduction is a process of inference that guarantees the truth of the conclusion if the premises are true. So, uh, the example that we have here, right? All, wh uh, all whales are mammals. Mr. Splashy is a whale. Therefore, Mr. Splashy is a mammal. And if you see, there is a kind of deduction, again, if the premises are true, and that allows us to make a, a true conclusion. Because really what's happening here is the premises have to, first of all, be correct. And you can almost see the answer in the first two premises, the fact that all whales are mammals, Therefore, Mr. Splashy is, is, a, is a whale, he appears to be a whale. Right off the bat, the first two premises should tell you what you're looking for. And that's why, that's why you have this therefore, ergo, uh, if, it's in, if it's in Latin. But therefore, or as a result, right, Mr. Splashy is a mammal. And again, this is why we have to look at it and say, this works only if the premises are true. Uh, if, it, if it does not work, that means that one of the premises is incorrect. We need to reject one of those. But as you can see, if you look at the first two, they really already contain the answer that you see simply spelled out as a, as a kind of afterthought uh, in the third, in the premise, the, the therefore or ergo. And this is how deductive reasoning uh, works. We have one statement followed by second statement, and those two statements together allow us to make a uh, I guess a truth statement, right? A, 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 not only just a value judgment, but an actual true statement. Now, inductive reasoning is something slightly different, right? Because scientific reasoning, again, at no point is a scientist coming out and saying, this is the absolute truth and nothing else is going to matter and nothing's going to change. Uh, somebody could revise the laws of gravity. We don't know, right? We couldn't all of us, we could all of a sudden go to another planet. And realize, wow, you know, the laws of gravity here are totally different. They they operate in the other way. Like no, nothing can you know could stay on the ground. It's pushing us in the opposite direction. Who knows? Doesn't matter. The point is, scientific reasoning is not deductive, right? It's inductive, and what it's doing, it's looking at information, and through observation and experimenting, it makes a kind of prediction, and that's that's what science does. It's making sort of calculated predictions that are based on observation and experimenting in the hopes that we will find the same thing over and over again. And again, the example here, you know, you can, you can think about, okay, a swan is a bird. Uh, a swan, a swans are usually white birds. And this is not the same sort of, you know, de uh, deductive logic. We just go, well, through observation, I have seen many swans in my life. They're all white. So I'm going to hypothesize. I'm going to predict statistically speaking, that every other swan I see between now and the end of my life is likely to be white. Now, there could be some mutation somewhere. Uh, and we there's the black one, still a swan, right? Still follows the the, the category of swan. It's a bird, it's, you know, it floats in the water, etc. But it's black. So now we cannot turn around and say that every single swan that exists on the planet Earth is white. There could always be some anomaly somewhere. So science continues to to observe and experiment in the hopes that it's able to make these statistical predictions. And that's really what science does, right? It bases it on a pattern that is being observed and tested. And the hypothesis is now generated from this pattern of uh, it has to be reasonably consistent. We can't just start making things up. We have to be able to look at it and say, is this a valid statement? Can I make this valid hypothesis based on on what I see. 
yes, the swans that I've seen, you know, whether I go to Stratford or somewhere else, there they are floating and they're all white. So I think, right, not I think therefore I am, but I think all swans are likely white. So there's no absolute information here. There's always a chance that something else could show up. So this is how science operates. And it doesn't mean that it's incorrect. It's just this is the best we know at the time. Now, we need to also be careful with scientific induction rather than deduction. We need to make sure that we are looking at correlations properly because um, correlations do not always indicate causation, right? The cause and effect of something uh, is not always completely clear. And of course, you can come up with all kinds of bizarre things. Uh, the d divorce rate in Maine is, you know, somehow uh, is correlated to the amount of margarine people consume or the number of bad Nicolas Cage movies seems to correlate to the amount of weed people smoke now. Who knows? But they're, they just happened at the same time. So you need to look at it and say, well, if we removed one of those premises, would it still be the same? Well, of course, you know, the rate of bad Nicolas Cage movies or the, the divorce rate. Oh, if we look at something else, oh, look at that. It goes up, you know, something else goes down. We need to be careful when we conduct scientific experiments that we're able to correlate the right things. So correlation does not always indicate causation. This is something very important because there's always the possibility of what's called contingencies. There could be something that the scientist is not considering is uh, not sort of in the purview of the world that they're, that they are considering as they formulate these hypotheses based on statistical evidence and, and from there, uh, some kind of consistent pattern. And this is what we mean by a pattern, you know, in this case, like the divorce rate in Maine and the consumption of margarine. So we need to be careful that the two actually do have something to do with one another. Otherwise, we need to start looking elsewhere. So scientific induction right, is what we're doing here. Um, we, we know that it works. And this is what happens when we have test after test after test. I mean, think, for example, of, of flight, right? Not flights with birds, but flights with us. When we think about airplanes, for example, where they started, uh, the Wright brothers in 190 whatever, uh, let's say very, very early in the 20th century. Then you compare it to jets that are so high up in the sky, we don't, we barely even hear them. Uh, we are able to fly to the moon. We've sent things, you know, rockets and satellites to all parts of the universe, clearly through refinement and experimenting and observing and more experimenting and more refinement and so on and so on we have moved and developed to the point where we're not just simply you know excited to land to fly eight feet off the ground for you know for half a mile we're going a little bit further so a scientific methodology induction seems to work to the certain degree because it has to do with observing and experimenting repeatedly so it is a it is a way of understanding the world and be able to um, to use nature, manipulate nature in various ways that is still scientifically sound. But the only way it works is if you can make these statistical predictions and they have to be based on patterns that are consistent, but are also correct. Right. Because, again, we want to make sure that, you know, correlation and causation do, in fact, work uh, and we are looking at the, re the right things. So. If we can do that, then we know that we've got at least a pretty good idea that scientific induction is going to work. Now, the kind of scientific theories that we're talking about, and there are many, and I, I don't have a, a degree in philosophy of science. Mine is sort of more left-leaning Hegelianism and so on. But certainly what I do know is when you're thinking about scientific theory, there's a whole range of things that experts are considering. And we'll just look at some of them right here. Um, you know, the degree of observational confirmation. Can you confirm what you're seeing? The strength of the correlation. Is it tenuous? Is it contingent? Or is it rock solid? Uh, the causal mechanisms explaining the correlation. Is it also consistently correct all the time? Relative simplicity of the theory. Uh, Occam's razor, for example, indicates that when you have a series of different hypotheses, go with a simple one. It's likely the correct one. And it's always uh, what scientists aim at doing. Uh, falsifiability. Can the theory be falsified, right? In other words, can can contradictions be, be discovered and identified fairly readily? And if that's the case, 
Can we correct it? And on and on. So there's a whole range of things that, that scientific experts can consider and aim for and, and be reminded of as they're conducting their observations. But for us, I mean, we don't think of all these kinds of things. We look at something and believe that it, there is a correlation. And that correlation is the cause and effect uh, relationship that we, we typically think of. So what we have here is logical deduction versus scientific induction. So let's look at them one last time here. We're looking at logical deduction, right? And that's reasoning on the basis of an accepted set of premises to reach a logically guaranteed conclusion. Now, the terminology here is interesting because a logical deduction means that the pieces fit together. Now, the degree to which you've ex explained it, right? Think of that word explain, right? You flattening out all the contradictions. Um, it fits because it, it is logical. And you consider that to scientific induction, right? Where reasoning is based on evidence that provides strong but not absolute support for the conclusion, right? It's, it's consistent. The pattern can be repeated. It can be observed. Uh, it's statistically, it's correct, but it does still work in such a way that there is always room for a deviation, right? For falsifiability. All these things matter when we are conducting scientific induction rather than using logic, which is one of the tools of reason. We're using logic to explain and articulate our idea. So if it fits and works logically, some people accept it as the absolute truth because it's not illogical. But scientific induction doesn't use logic in exactly the same way. It's more concerned with observing and testing and observing again and testing again. And that's what the scientific method is trying to do. So inductive reasoning is a st statistical process, right? Where you have the conclusions are likely, but not absolute. Um, and of course we found, for example, uh, just we finished having an American election on Tuesday and the polls leading into that election uh, appeared to have sort of this blue wave, this overwhelming blue wave, and yet, by the end of this week, we knew that at least 70 million people had still voted for Trump. And I'm not going to start to scream about Trump here. The point I'm making is that even with polling, right, that is still not an exact science. Right? It's scientific, but it's not it's not exact. There's always, you know, margins of error. There's falsifiability and so on. But the notion is we have a reasonable idea. It's done in a way that is fairly consistent because, again, the conditions need to be the same, but it doesn't always work out that, that way. The contingencies is people change their minds, right? And that's just for polling, that is. Okay, so that's basically sort of uh, logical deduction and scientific induction. And now we're going to take a look at uh, John Locke, uh, who was one of several important and well-known British empiricists. Like I say, there, uh, Thomas Hobbes was a kind of empiricist, Francis Bacon definitely, Locke, Berkeley, and so on, and David Hume. And these individuals were considering, okay, trying to use induction, scientific induction as a method to argue for empirical data, for empiricism. And for them, knowledge is grounded in sense experience, right? And sense experience is essentially experience because it is the way we experience the world, that the world comes to us. And the sense impressions that it makes upon us, its sights and smells and sounds, become the, the foundational data for us to collect knowledge. So Locke and the others were, consi were, were consistent in using science as an inductive method and to argue for this empirical view of the world, right? Knowledge is based on sense experience. So empiricists argued that all knowledge came from experience. There was no innate knowledge. We're not born with a set of ideas. And you know who came up with that one? That was Plato. Plato believed that certain people were born with this innate knowledge that was buried deep inside them. And what reason did was unlocked knowledge that was always already there. So we weren't really no learning anything new. Uh, we were simply becoming aware of what was already within us. Now, yes, it sounds a bit weird, but think about Plato's idea of perfect forms. They're ahistorical. They're eternal. So you can't 
you can't have one without the other. So you're saying, well, those eternal ahistorical ideas that exist outside of time are inside some of us. Funny enough, only aristocrats. Hmm, I wonder why. So Locke says, no, no, we are born essentially as a blank slate. And our lived experience is experience that is the foundation for our knowledge about the world. And that's really in the long and the short of it. So empiricists like Locke said that there is no innate knowledge, right? And logic is simply a tool. It's an empty vessel into which you pour, you know, different content, empirical content. Now, logic are just the rules for reasoning right they're not rules about the world they're rules about the way in which you go about understanding the world how you piece together your argument as, as it were so let's just kind of take a look at uh, what we talked about uh, last week as well so this should sound still fairly familiar now Locke says we're empirical uh, if we are believing in sense data as the foundation of our knowledge and we derive knowledge of the world from what the senses are telling us and this is how it works so the the senses that we have, we acquire simple ideas, right? The no, the color red, right? The taste of sour, uh, the sight of a round object. Okay, th those things are simple ideas and pretty straightforward, but combined together in different ways become the building blocks for much more complex ideas. And where reason comes in and logic comes in is in creating these mental combinations. Obviously, we can't have a square apple that's plaid, right? Doesn't exist. I maybe somewhere, who knows? You know, give Mount Monsanto enough time and it'll happen. But these mental combinations are the way in which we take those simple pieces of data, red, sour, round, triangular, green, whatever, and we combine them together. And we look at something and we say, okay, I've combined these things together, especially seeing something for the first time. Imagine, imagine let's say Darwin, seeing a platypus for the first time like what is that right <laughs> it's a duck it's a mammal it's okay what is this freak of nature here and yet that's what a platypus looks like so just think about the mental combination that had to go into looking at this thing and going okay what is it is it a mammal is it a bird is it because it has all these weird different qualities so what eventually we did is we took those simple ideas right what a mammal looks like, what what a, you know, what a bird looks like, or a duck in this case, and we combine them together because we saw something that resembled these different things that were put together. It literally existed in front of us. We had to make sense of it. So we did it by combining these simple ideas together using mental combinations. So those those things are capable. And are th these things we can do because we can use logic and reason to formulate these mental combinations to create something. Now, you can also think of uh, a unicorn, right? It has qualities of being a horse, uh, qualities of having, you know, a horned animal. We think of a rhinoceros with a horn. So we combine these two together. Whether or not they actually exist, right? Statistically likely or unlikely, that's a different story. So when we are thinking about the world, and more important, how we organize that experience, that's where we're using logic and reason. And so when we talk about something uh, that is in the world, something as simple as an apple, right? What we're doing is we're combining those different elements, right? The color, the shape, the texture, the taste and smell. Again, we talked about this last week, but it is worth going over because uh, it does allow us to look at empiricism in, you know, in a kind of larger context. So what we consider to be an apple is a combination of simple ideas or simple senses brought together to give us something that has a degree of appleness. So what do we consider something with appleness? Well, a certain roundness, a certain color, a certain taste, a certain weight, right? Apples aren't two metric tons. You know, they're not as heavy as a dying sun. They're only usually a couple of ounces. So all those things together, if you break them apart, right and then you recombine them that mental combination tells us okay all those qualities are there for me to say that even without tasting it that's likely an apple and then you reach down and pick it up and it's made out of plastic okay but it had all the qualities of appleness but it wasn't a real one so that can happen not only uh, did Locke believe that we had the capacity to use logic and reason to to formulate complex ideas out of simple ideas, 
But uh, unlike Descartes, uh, Locke also thought that, you know, these ideas that we had really grow out, out, of, out of our life experiences, right? They come from sense data, from our senses, our experiences of the world. Because remember, uh, Descartes is saying that, you know, we have innate ideas because here's, here's a philosopher who, upon stripping away everything except cogito, right? The ability to think, the first thing he seeks to prove is the existence of God, right? Now, that begs the question, someone who has no innate ideas, would they have been able to come up with, with an idea like God? Of a, of a Godhead, of some spiritual entity that created the world that we are experiencing. We don't know, right? We don't know because that's one of these questions you, you can ask. If Descartes is correct, right, in his logical, you know, deductions, could he have lived somewhere where he, the word God had never been spoken before and still come up with this so-called innate idea? Locke says, no, probably not. Because these ideas are born out of our experiences, right? They're born out of our lived reality in the world. And we build up over time uh, incre increasingly more complex ideas about the world the more we interact, right? That's called wisdom. It's called experience. But when we're born, right, we are basically a blank slate. So believe, uh, Locke believes that we are tabula rasa, right? We are a blank slate upon which we write our lives. And our lives are all these sense experiences, right? All the experiences of life that we have. Now, there's always the question, right? Can we trust our senses? Uh, are they always going to give us these, these properties that we can use simple properties, simple ideas to combine together? Because when we are talking about um, these primary simple ideas, these are actually what Locke calls objective properties of an object. Right? They're objective in the sense that uh, extension is simply the room it takes up in the world, right? The, the physical space it occupies, weight, what, what something weighs, you know, motion if that's involved, and the amount. All those things are pretty straightforward. I mean, two pounds is two pounds no matter what. Even if you convert it to, you know, to, uh, to kilos, it doesn't matter. The weights will be consistent. Where things are not so consistent are those secondary qualities, right? Uh, color, taste, and sound. Um, if you've ever doubted that, go shopping with someone and each of you try to pick out the color taupe, right? Or, or different shades of blue, different shades of purple. No, it's mauve. No, it's purple. Uh, it's almost black. No, it's dark purple, etc. That's what I mean. S some of these qualities are objective because they are verifiable. They, they are the same no matter who is looking at them because Two pounds is two pounds, no matter who's measuring it. But those secondary qualities, they're the ones that are kind of up for grabs because people can taste things differently, can hear things differently, if at all. Or color may be more subjective. So there are those subjective experiences that there is, you know, there's room for error. Um, and again, the, the, the pre-Socratics, Epicurus uh, talked about that. Uh, Democritus talked about that, that, you know, these things are difficult to prove because what is sweet to one person may be sour to another. So we need to be careful uh, in distinguishing these objective properties versus these subjective experience of those properties. So um, as Locke says, our ideas of primary qualities resemble the qualities in the object, while, while our ideas of secondary qualities do not resemble the powers that cause them. So when we talk about taste, yes, it is the sense data, but it will mean something a little bit different to each person. So reason is there for us to at least uh, minimize the, the contingencies, right? The, the, the variations and differences or the falsifiability of something. Uh, reason can play a role, right? There is uh, the idea that it is going to be there to help us combine those simple pieces of information to complex ideas. And one of the things that we use is also logic, right? It needs to make sense. So to be reasonable means that something you've considered makes sense. It, it follows logically, right? We, we talk about these things, well, it follows, you know, it makes sense. That's right. That's what Locke is talking about. We're using reason in order to understand that the complex idea we have created in our minds is in fact correct. 
And then he writes, uh, while the mind may be a blank, blank slate in, regard, in regards to content, right, the actual result of the experiences, uh, Locke thinks that we are born with a variety of faculties to receive the, uh, and abilities to manipulate or process the content once we acquire it. Because it isn't just sense data, right? It isn't just that. It's it, just raw data. No, we take that, do that data and we formulate something out of it. But the only way we can formulate these mental combinations is by using reason. So when we talk about uh, what is out there in the world, um, we talk about knowledge. And for uh, Locke, knowledge is not innate, right? It requires something to stimulate that knowledge because knowledge is always of something, right? Knowledge about something, about the world, about our proverbial apples or whatever else. Those things are important because we have to have that ability to organize that experience into something that we can then present to someone. And short of walking around with a wheelbarrow with apples and, you know, divorce rates and so on, we can talk about them. We know what we are discussing because we agree to it using language that an apple has these particular qualities, uh, you know, objective qualities, weight and, and, and color and so on, subjective properties, maybe taste and so on. Uh, but the thing is, whatever we are doing, we're always discussing knowledge about something, whatever it may be. And we do it, and we, we do it by using logic, but remembering that logic is simply a tool. It's an empty vessel, right, into which we pour the, the content to see whether it fits together. That co correlation and causation are in fact correct, that these things are gonna, are going to match up and work. So logic is empty. Logic is not the data. Logic is what we do with the data and what, how we manipulate it using reason and making it reasonable. So, the form of logical reasoning uh, is central to deductive uh, reasoning. So the form of logical reasoning, um, if you are a rationalist, right, you can explain and flatten out all those contradictions without the world changing in any real way. Uh, when we get to Marx in a, in a few weeks, but Marx takes this and essentially turns it on his head. Right. When he says famously the uh, thesis on Feuerbach number 11, you know, that that philosophers have only sought to interpret the world. Our job is to change it because what he says and why this is important here is because logical reasoning has the capacity to flatten out those contradictions without ever dealing with them in, a, in the real world. Uh, and so if that's the case, we have to remind ourselves that logic is empty of content. It doesn't have the data in there. We put the data into it and that's how we test it and see whether it is reasonable. And so if we are rationalists, then we believe that the form of logical reasoning is perfectly fine. But for Locke, he says, no, ultimately that knowledge is innate and we think about these things and we use logic. But remember, uh, I, Locke is thinking like a scientist. We may have an observation, but we need to continually experiment to make sure that the observation is in fact correct. Now, one of the issues with Locke, too, is uh, the notion that ultimately there are there are words that describe uh, the reality that we experience that really doesn't doesn't exist out there. And this is what's called nominalism. And nominalism is this idea that universals right, don't exist except nominally because and the word no right in French, that's word. That's French for word. So we have words to describe universal qualities. And if that's the case, like when you think of the color red, okay, so close your eyes for a moment, red. Some of you probably thinking light red, uh, could be deep red, could be blood red, could be the red of a, of a stop sign, right? Suddenly red is shifting back and forth. Red in and of itself, redness, doesn't exist. It's only a word, right? It's a no, right? It's, so nominalism means that. When we are throwing these words around, literally, we are talking about things that really ultimately only exist in language. So they don't exist far away and, you know, in some perfect world like Plato. Aristotle uh, says the opposite. No, the universal exists in the thing itself. But Locke says, okay, hold on. Let's back up even further here. No, the notion of a universal thing is simply existing in language. So the notion of nominalism is quite important in terms of discussing ideas, right? discussing what we understand about the world. So if that's the case, let's remind ourselves that those universals, red, 
round, you know, triangular, whatever, ultimately are just words that we agree to that they will make this kind of sense. Now, having said that, though, Locke was still a, a dualist uh, who believed, that, like Descartes, that uh, there was a distinction between mind and body, but not a distinction such, such that the two could not co uh, co uh, cooperate and, you know, to speak to one another. Because if the body is the source of the sense data, clearly it needs to speak to the mind. So although the mind was spiritual and the body was physical, unlike Descartes, Locke believed that it, they could talk to one another. So then that is very important. Okay, so if Locke is correct in his idea of nominalism, the fact that these universals, red, brown, triangular, whatever, only exist in language, uh, we're able to form these complex ideas by associating, you know, these simple sense perceptions into further and further uh, and more complex ideas. Now, uh, it begs the question, which is, does this imply that we really only have knowledge of our idea of the world, as opposed to knowledge of the world itself? And to a certain degree, that's true. Uh, again, here's another sort of anomaly. Uh, Plato, who was a rationalist, who believed in the beauty of you know, the, uh, the beauty of perfect forms, also believed that it was possible for an individual to have true knowledge that is that is uh, conveyed through experience. He believed that there was you could experience everything about the world in a lifetime. Now, at the time, of course, the world was much smaller. It was basically the Mediterranean area in Greece. So you could make a claim like that and not sound illogical. Uh, the world today, we, we know of literally every part of it. We've been to the moon. We've sent, you know, uh, different satellites and, and, and ships to Mars. Uh, we've got things floating all over the place. Our notion of, of the universe and our knowledge of it expands constantly. So, we have ideas, you know, hypotheses about the world. And what we do really in our interactions is often unconsciously test some of these hypotheses. Sometimes we do well, sometimes not so well. But the knowledge that we have of the world uh, of itself is, according to Locke, you know, what we experience ourselves. So we can only encounter reality through the concept that we have, that we've constructed of it, that's mediated through our senses. So if that's the case, uh, empiricism, yes, is giving us knowledge, but if we are true, hardcore uh, sort of empiricists, we would have to argue that what's going on is knowledge that only we have of the world. Now, clearly that's not right, because we can read books. Uh, I could read a book by Neil Armstrong, the first astronaut to land on the moon, and he could describe to me in great detail what, what that was like. I didn't sense experience it but I'm able to, to formulate an idea of it. And especially when he starts describing how, oh, we bounced around, you know, the, the, it was like one sixth the amount of gravity. Okay, I understand the concept of gravity. So I'm thinking one sixth of it. Okay, obviously you can bounce around and I get, I get the sense of what he's talking about. This is what Locke means that on the one hand, you know, our sense data, our knowledge of the world is what we experience, but we also have other people's experiences. And if we are good people, we listen to them and we share in those experiences because we share in this thing called language where there are all kinds of nominalisms, right? In the plural. So we understand what these people are saying to us because we may not have experienced it directly, but we can correlate those complex ideas to our own experiences, at least to a certain degree. So ultimately what we're talking about here is when we are discussing sort of idealism, Idealism really is, you know, in language. If if Locke is right and nominalism is in fact correct, and these universals that Plato went on and on about, they only exist in language, right? Because remember, he said it, those things only exist in our minds. So if that's the case, that's where language resides. So is it possible that the only reality that we have is the reality that we can connect with through language? Uh, Locke did have a lot of ideas, uh, or uh, ideas about ideas, really, in this book here, an essay on uh, human understanding. And he talks about here in uh, Book 3, uh, Chapter 11, Section 14, which I'll just read to you, where he does highlight the importance of language and especially the, the agreed-to nature of language. Language works because we all agree, we 
socially it's, it's acceptable that this word means this or that. But ultimately, when we talk about some of these ideas, no, we may not be able to encounter reality directly, but we can certainly articulate what our senses experience through language. So language mediates right our, our perception. So he writes, okay, when a man makes use of the name of any simple idea, which he perceives is not understood or is in danger to be mistaken, he is obliged by the laws of ingenuity and the end of speech to declare his meaning and make known what idea he makes it stand for. This, as it has been shown, cannot be done by definition, and therefore when a synonymous word fails to do it, there is but one way left. First, sometimes the naming the subject, wherein the simple idea is to be found, will make its name be understood by those who are acquainted with the subject. In other words, I use a word that you recognize. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know what the word round means. Okay. So, acquainted with the subject and know it by that name. So, to make a countryman understand what uh, furry mort color signifies, it may suffice him to tell, tis the color of withered leaves falling in autumn. Secondly, but the only sure way of making known the significance of the name by any simple idea is by presenting to his senses that subject which may produce, produce it in his mind and make him actually have the idea that words stand for. So what Locke is saying is there is an interaction between the mind, which may be spiritual, and reality, that external reality. And in between, that mediator is language. Because we are only able to express what we experience through language. There it is. So. Without language, we really couldn't discuss reality. We couldn't articulate it in the slightest to other people. We would simply have sense data all the time and we'd be overwhelmed and unable to speak, which is, I think, why little babies get really frustrated sometimes and you think, what's wrong with them? Imagine being on the cusp of articulating in your mind just the most rudimentary things about the world, but you haven't got the vocabulary. And if you've ever, if you've ever been uh, around a child between about one and a half to two years old, they're just starting to, they, they understand knowledge, but they certainly understand language. They're formulating early ideas of knowledge, but they are frustrated to no end in not being able to express it. And so you get a lot of frustrated little kids. And I'm saying this because my uh, latest um, grand, uh, grandchild is about sort of 18 months now. So he's kind of right on the cusp and it's fascinating to watch because I think of things like what Locke says that, you know, without language, we are unable to express what we consider to be reality. At that age, I'll imagine the, the frustration is beyond all measure because the thought is there, but is unable to be expressed because language is just not formulated to the degree where we know what, what they're trying to say. So finally, at this point, all right, um, this notion that thought could not have, could not have originated in matter. And it's true because thought is the result of matter. It is the result of the sense experience. It is not the sense experience itself. So what we're doing here is we're making sort of slight gradations between sense experience, touch, smell, our thoughts of it, us expressing that thought in a word that makes sense to us and then may also make sense to someone else, which is what I read in that passage to someone that is not maybe well educated, you know, a certain color you can relate to. Well, it kind of kind of looks like, you know, have you ever seen a tabby cat? You know, that kind of orange well, is that orange? All oh, right. OK, there you go. And that's what he's talking about. But the thought that goes into it, it has more to do with language than it has to do with matter itself. So thought cannot originate from matter. It starts it but it is what is happening in our minds based on our lived reality and lived reality in terms of all kinds of experiences that we collect over time and we start filling up that blank slate right, with ideas. So he says in Essay Concerning Human Understanding, if then, the, if then there must be something eternal, let us say what sort of being it must be. And to that it is very ob 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 obvious to reason that it must necessarily be a cogitative being, right, uh, a thought being. For it is impossible to conceive that ever bare incogitative matter should produce a thinking intelligent being, as that nothing should of itself produce matter. So when we consider uh, our experiences, our interaction with matter, 
ultimately there has to be sort of some what Locke calls the light of reason. That light of reason allows us to connect the sense data with a word and allows us to connect that word with our speech and our speech in a social context, speaking to another person, and the whole thing sort of completes the circle. And we are able to speak to people about our, our experiences and they understand what we're saying because it's logical to them. It is reasonable to them. Uh, dogs are not purple. They're not, you know, plaid. They could be one somewhere, but we say statistically speaking, it's highly unlikely, right? And that's kind of the way we leave it. Okay, so that's basically Locke. And now what I'd like to do is uh, just turn here for the last um, 10 or 11 slides that we have on the French Enlightenment, which is going on roughly at the same time. Now, Locke at this point is uh, is no, no longer there um, because he's passed away, but the French, the French Enlightenment is in full swing. And we have the encyclopedia, uh, uh, that's misspelled. There we go. Uh, the encyclopedias, this would be uh, Diderot. Diderot is this character right here. Uh, Voltaire and Rousseau, Baron d'Holbach, uh, Diderot and so on. Um, these, uh, Montesquieu as well, can't forget that. So Montesquieu, Voltaire, Rousseau, uh, these are the, the, the sort of the main characters, right, in the play that is the French Enlightenment. Uh, some are much more radical. Uh, La Maîtrie, Helvetius, uh, Baron d'Holbach are, are much more radical in their, in their, in their attempt to, um, to introduce utility, right, rather than superstition into everyday society. And all of these, uh, individuals, radical or centrist, were opposed to authority and especially arguments coming down from authority because authority at this point was the nobility, in other words, the aristocracy and the monarchy and clergy. And those two forces made life in France a living hell, <laughs> essentially. So uh, Descartes really is, is the philosopher that although is not typically associated with the French Enlightenment, sets the main foundation of French Enlightenment thought in terms of his ability to be a skeptic. Because now this skeptical tool is now going to be used against authority, against the clergy, against the nobility, uh, ideas of things being illogical, that, you know, that the, the clergy is preaching a kind of superstitious nonsense that is just so disconnected from reality that it's people shouldn't even believe in it anymore. It, it is now a form of social control, not a form of spirituality. And so again, this is, these are the institutions of the clergy, the institutions of nobility that are now going off the rails. So Descartes presents to the French Enlightenment this fantastic tool that was around in various ways, or, you know, various sort of uh, versions in ancient Greek thought, but not to the degree that it is now. This is one of the reasons why Descartes is considered to be uh, the beginning of modern philosophy, the skeptical formulations of philosophy, the questioning of authority kind of philosophy. So at this point now, skepticism begins to um, to sort of creep into uh, thoughts by philosophers who are enlightened in the sense that they're looking to find a better way. And in France in particular, the situation was not very good because the nobility and the clergy were really oppressing people. And these enlightened philosophers were looking at the world around them going, okay, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a different relationship to God, a different relationship to nature, to morality. This isn't working because these authority figures were manipulating individuals into believing things that were patently not true, but to their ends. So they were using religion to manipulate use, uh, manipulate others so that they could remain in power and others would simply be too terrified to ask any questions. And the Enlightenment identified specific reasons why the situation was, was such in France. Uh, poverty, uh, political oppression, ignorance and superstition through lack of education. And because of that, they're saying, look, you know, all of us have this light of reason. Some of you just aren't even able to for five seconds to think about it because you're so busy having to work to keep alive. So these kinds of things became the tools by which the French Enlightenment sought to change the world for the better, change the reality that individuals had about the world for something that was more enlightened, more universally appealing, 
more logical, uh, but always based on this notion of utility. Is something useful? And we'll talk about utilitarianism, I think, next week. Um, and so we have these movements to, to change things, uh, an attempt to increase the literacy rate in, in the population, uh, having access to education. Because remember, if you are poor, ignorant, superstitious, you are an ideal candidate to be, to be manipulated. Because guess what? You're not even aware that you're being uh, manipulated. And no, I'm not going to talk about Trump, although I'd love to right now. But if you are poor, ignorant, superstitious, and so busy working that you don't even have time to think critically, what, when will you, right? When will you think about the world and say, well, this is awful, like, there's got to be a better way. Yes, the difference here between, say, Plato as an aristocrat, or even Aristotle, and Montesquieu, and Voltaire, and um, maybe not Rousseau so much, but uh, Baron Dolbach, these guys were not aristocrats, but they were wealthy. They were, they were to some degree, somewhat powerful, but they were well off. They had the time to think and to think and reflect at the level of illiteracy and the lack of education and opportunities people had. And so the work of the Enlightenment was to try to change that for the better. One of the really remarkable things that uh, that were done was the encyclopedia. Now, when you think of an encyclopedia, you know, um, whatever, Funk and Magnals or, you know, whichever encyclopedia company that you may have had, you may have had one of those when you were a kid. But when I say that, I mean, when I was a kid, that's a 70s, where people did have encyclopedias, kids to you now might be, you know, the 80s and 90s. Encyclopedias were already kind of on the way out, especially with the internet and access. The point that here of the encyclopedia was for the first time, general knowledge was suddenly available. And not only that, uh, it was worthwhile practical information on a whole range of topics on science and religion uh, and mathematics and philosophy and all sorts of things, the humanities. And really, the most important thing, what Diderot did, and this is this is what he created and has left behind to the French population, is these encyclopedias. And we can see them on the next uh, the next slide here. OK, 28 volumes. Right, 71, almost 72,000 different articles over almost 3,200 different uh, illustrations. Now published between 1751 and 65, and the last ones were finished around 1772, so still before before the French Revolution. And what's remarkable at this at uh, this time is in the encyclopedia, everything is presented alphabetically. In other words, not through order of importance. So you would find uh, let's say, you know, a, a passage on God on the same page as, as something like G-O-D. There might be something right next to it that starts with uh, G-O-R. And so what the encyclopedia did is it leveled the playing field. It made everything of equal importance, but it did not prioritize uh, things about the clergy, things about, or ideas and, and, uh, and items and entrances about the clergy or the monarchy and so on. Everything was on the same footing. So you could be reading about religion and reading about plants, right? Only a few pages later. So everything was leveled. And of course, this outraged the, the censors because of course you can't talk about religion this way. It's a separate thing. And Diderot and the rest of his uh, encyclopedia uh, folks, um, uh, Dolbach wrote many, many articles. So did Rousseau. I uh, wrote a famous article on music, for example, who so that is. But the point was, suddenly now the world was presented at our fingertips. So to the issue that we raised with Locke, right, who said, you know, we our knowledge is whatever our lived experience is, along within, let's say, 50 years of his life, along comes a set of books that literally presents the entire world to us under one cover. Well, series of covers, because there's 28 volumes. But the notion of the world at our fingertips, this had never happened before. I know it's like, hey, sir, you're really getting upside, you know, uptight over books, but it is remarkable what this this dictionary really was, because dictionaries and thesauruses and encyclopedias, these are these things are being written for the first time. At our fingertips is all the words that we use in our language. I mean, think about that. Imagine, imagine not having a dictionary. I don't know how many of you use dictionaries and thesauruses. Um, mine are sitting on my desk 
all the time because I write all the time. I always want to know that I'm picking the right word, the best word to express my ideas. And if I'm not sure, I pick up my thesaurus and I flip through and I find oh, that word means exactly what I'm trying to say. Now imagine that and an encyclopedia for the first time so people can understand the world. Uh, it is, it is a, a remarkable thing. Now, along with all of this, an increase in education, an attempt to increase literacy, uh, an expanded notion of, you know, of what rights are to, to individuals is also the notion of nature and natural reason, right? Th these are ideas that come up. Um, the reason uh, or the, that reason was inherent and also natural is an idea that, you know, we see in Plato, we see in Locke, right? The light of reason, right? That, which is what he calls it in his books, reason as, as the light of nature. In other words, it's a natural thing. And we don't want it beaten out of us or terrified out of us. It's part of who we are. It's part of our nature. So we can be reasonable by nature. It's something that we have within us that we should explore. And so Locke is the first one to talk about this. And Locke was very, very much appreciated and respected by the French Enlightenment. He essentially, uh, his book or his ideas in uh, two treatises of government are essentially rewritten by Rousseau in French. Uh, his is called The Social Contract, but essentially the ideas are very, very similar. And both of those books lay the foundation for the French Revolution. They, those books were that influential. So reason is now considered something natural that we have within ourselves. It is a tool that we use. The light of reason is the way by which we will understand and enlighten ourselves, be able to see something, right? See in its full capacity. So uh, that, that's kind of the regular French Enlightenment folks. Then we have the more radical folks, uh, um, La Maîtrie and Helvetius and, and Baron Dolbach. Uh, these individuals in particular looked at religion specifically as this very unnatural view of the world uh, based on superstition and prejudice and biases of one sort and just terror, just sheer abject terror of the world, uh, afraid of, you know, of these personal gods intervening and somehow you know coming in and, and destroying everything and that you you have to give the church money otherwise you know you won't go to, to, to heaven and meanwhile these people have nothing they literally are starving oh got to give them more and the french the radical french enlightenment thinkers just were disgusted by that they said look why can't we just think of in the way that reason is natural could religion be natural and it is here that we again revisit this idea of deism, right? This notion of a natural religion. This idea that, that religious beliefs could also be reasonable. And so we have this no notion that, you know, um, yeah, atheism was in a sense irrational because the light of nature comes almost from a divine source. So here there's a kind of a reconstituting of, of a spiritual figure within nature. Uh, but in this case here with natural religion, uh, it's closer to deism, right? Because we have this impersonal God who has, of course, created nature, uh, should not be feared because essentially we can't really speak to him, all right? Or speak to it, right? Because now we're back to this sort of personification or that anthropomorphism. Uh, but certainly for us, you know, we, we personify God as the old man, you know, with a beard sitting on a cloud. Um, the natural religion part of it is this notion of an impersonal God, however it may look like. But the fact that this, this spiritual power, now remember, this is coming after Spinoza, that reason and observation uh, of the natural world, right? And the laws that interact, right? All the things that Spinoza is talking about are enough, right? Are sufficient for us to imagine that there is the existence of this single creator. The difference is, with natural religion, this is not a God that we can, you know, supplicate and offer prayers to and sacrifices and, you know, it or he, but it will intervene on our behalf, right? It, natural religion isn't about that. It's saying and acknowledging that there is a spiritual force in nature, but it's one that we cannot communicate with. It just is there, right? But of course, the Catholic Church at that point was trying to convince people otherwise saying that you know if you pray to god things will go well and by the way don't forget to leave you know money at the the end of the service so there is seriously a problem with the institution of religion versus the notion right of simply theology there, there's a disconnect a very uh 
powerful and disturbing disconnect between these two things, between the institution and between thought itself. So the Enlightenment, what was it? Okay, it was um, uh, the, the translation here, uh, le siècle de, uh, de lumière, lumière is light, right? This notion of, of placing a light on something, uh, aufklären is the German uh, version of the same thing, and it occurs at roughly the same time and does dominate most of the 1700s into sort of early 1800s, then we get modernity, but certainly the 1700s is considered in the history of philosophy, the history of consciousness, or the history of thought as the period of enlightenment in England, in France, and in Germany. It looks slightly different and it responds to slightly different things uh, in France to the clergy and to the, and to the, uh, to the nobility. Uh, while in, in England, it's more sort of a scientific enlightenment, you know, a, a stress on the scientific method, not so much about the church. Uh, but depending on where you are, see, you're finding it, it is the same kind of thing, right? They're all promoting similar ideas, uh, political liberty, human individual liberty, uh, scientific progress, human progress, the use of a reason rather than superstition in everyday affairs. Um, religious tolerance. So again, we're not saying to uh, throw away, um, you know, the, the clergy and the institution and the thought and everything else. We have to reform, reform the institution. But these individuals are still speaking about religious tolerance and human tolerance as well. Um, and ending the abuses, especially in France, ending the abuses of the church and the state against its own people. And that is very, very important. Uh, but in France in particular, right, the, from the, the, uh, the Lumiere thinkers, the philosophers of the Enlightenment, but in particular, individual liberty and religious tolerance. Now, some individuals have um, interpreted the thoughts of Helvetius and, and Dolbach as pure atheism because they were so disgusted by the institution of the clergy uh, that their their writings appear to throw out, in a sense, as they say, the baby with the bathwater. They want to throw out religion along with the institution. And that's not exactly what they're saying. What they are saying, uh, if, if you read uh, Dolbach's The System of Nature or Christianity Unveiled, those books go on at length about the abuses of the church, not the ridiculous notion of God because they are willing to concede deist, a deistic entity, right? An impersonal God, but they are writing about the actual political institution, not a religious one, but a political institution of the church. That's what they're responding to. And that's why they were so concerned with individual liberty and religious tolerance, right? And so all of these ideas are pushing back against this corrupt institution, uh, the absolute monarchy, the dogmas of the Roman Catholic Church, all of these things are really uh, pushing down upon individuals and keeping them, uh, you know, stupid, superstitious, and, uh, you know, prejudiced over other things, and somehow convinced that if they just keep giving their money to the church, then they're all going to end up in heaven. Who knows, right? So it becomes a very difficult way to, to, to live one's life. So one of the, the German thinkers who is also a, kind of almost on the tail end of enlightenment, because enlightenment sort of, I don't want to say peters out, but it, it becomes other things. But it is sort of essentially over in the early 1800s. Uh, but Immanuel Kant is writing, uh, still li living at this time, let's say 1775 to 1790 is sort of his main period. But he writes about the enlightenment. Um, and he says, what is the Enlightenment? That's in fact the name of the article. What is Enlightenment? And he says, what that is, is man's emergence from his self-imposed immaturity. Immaturity here is the inability to use one's understanding without guidance from another, right? From a book, from the tools of reason. This immaturity is self-imposed when its cause lie not in a lack of understanding, but in a lack of resolve and courage to use it without guidance from others. In other words, not to have an authority figure, whether it's from coming from the pulpit or from the throne, an authority figure saying, this is, this is it. This is the world as it is. Stop worrying about it. Stop thinking about it. And so he says, sapere ode, right? Dare to know, dare to know, have the courage, right? To use your own understanding, 
Now, that's not to say that you go on YouTube and you know, I'm doing research and you click on one video that does all the work for you and you know, tells you, talks about 5G networks and all kinds of other stuff and chemtrails and you know, this is where it goes wrong because Kant is saying this, you know, it is a lack of resolve and courage to use it without guidance from another. Because the moment you start to talk to these folks that have gotten all their education, because, you know, you can't believe the news media, you can't believe science, you know, the vested interests and whatever. No, Kant would literally be spinning in his grave going, no, that's not what I said. What I did say was learn by, learn on your own. Make up your own mind. You have a reason within you. He, like Locke, like Plato and everybody else, have all said essentially the same thing. There is no philosopher that's ever said, we don't have reason. And Kant is simply reminding us, use that reason. Do not use the guidance of another. If you wish to know something, dare to know. Go out and explore and find out on your own. So is it radical? Not really. But what is radical about it is no longer relying on figures of authority. Now remember Aristotle, for example, was already being sort of uh, questioned and you know made skeptical uh, by thinkers going back as early as the 1600s. Uh, Kant is writing at least 150 years later, but is still essentially saying the same thing. Now, for this time, uh, because the situation in France was awful, the notion of human rights, right? We're talking about natural reason, natural religion, and why not natural human rights, right? These are natural things. The world had twisted these things to the degree where everything was becoming unnatural. So freedom of thought, freedom of expression, uh, freedom of assembly, all these things become sort of what are considered natural rights and for the most part, become entrenched in law. And this is what happens when we have uh, the rights of man and citizens in, or citizen, uh, singular, in 1789. This is this very radical text where the rights of individuals and, and citizens is entrenched in terms of thought, expression, freedom of assembly, the abolition of slavery, the, the uh, beginnings of institutions of democracy, uh, universal suffrage, that means, that means the ability to vote, um, and of course, the the American Revolution instills the very same ideas, and it too was also influenced by Locke and by Rousseau, mostly by Locke, because we can see you know his breakdown of of the branches of government, for example. But all of this is going on at this time, so we have these ideas of natural rights, and those natural rights, which for Locke existed in a state of nature, but were not entrenched; they were not protected by institutions and by legal. Uh, especially legal institutions, so the individuals could say, yes, I have a right to vote. I have a right to express my thoughts. I have a right to assemble. So this is going on at a time when individuals are realizing that they have these rights that they should have entrenched. Now, um, natural rights extending to women, eh, right? It was kind of just starting. Uh, individuals, both in France and in, in England, were writing about this. Uh, Condorcet uh, was writing about, you know, the idea of political equality as early as 1786. So during the revolution or during all that turmoil, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft wrote hers in 1792. So not much later, still during the French Revolution. But in France, uh, uh, de Georges uh, also wrote the same thing and was beheaded for it. So it took a much longer period of time for the French to extend these so-called natural rights to women. And so uh, it took a long time for those rights to be entrenched right across the board. So as we can imagine, universal ideas, right? Universal rights, again, like in ancient uh, Athens, extended only to men. And it took a long time for that to change. For example, uh, in the U.S., uh, voting rights for women were not uh, given, uh, suffrage to, to women was not until 1920. Uh, in Canada, we started as early in the West Coast as or 1916. Um, and over a period of time, over about six years um, to 1922, sort of across Canada, with Quebec holding out until 1940, until the, until the Second World War. Uh, 1928 in the UK, but again, 1944 in France. Until 1965, an unmarried woman could not even hold a bank account. You had to be married to be able to have an, a bank account of your own, which is remarkably 
like backwards, but here we are. So for all that political universalism and, you know, suffrage and so on, uh, they are essentially half of the population. And from the time that we were right, we we're talking about right now, the, the French Enlightenment and the Revolution, it still took another 150 years for that to happen. So it is the kind of idea that we, we would, you know, we need to be mindful of that when we're talking at this time about universal suffrage or universal ideas, they often uh, ex, uh, exclude women, just like they did in ancient Athens when their version of democracy was not only uh, much m more narrow, but it, in fact with men, but only propertied men. Now, the idea of democracy at least was there, which was self-representation, or at least having a voice and a, and a form of a kind of voting uh, that was specific to, to Athens, but still considered a kind of vote. But the democracy we have today, we have to say, comes from the French model. Right, these uh, Declaration of Rights. We now have what's called a Charter of Rights in Canada that we had uh, signed in the the mid 80s. So that's what people that's what people use. If they have a human rights issue, you go to the Charter. You look at the Charter, and there that information is there to look at and say, I am being discriminated against. But it still took for women another 150 years for them to be able to have the rights that men had as early as the end of the French Revolution. So that's basically uh, John Locke. We didn't really talk about Hume a whole lot, but we will talk about him next week. Um, and the uh, the French Enlightenment and Enlightenment in general. And we'll continue that again because Hume and Kant, who are the two main uh, philosophers that we look at next week, still are part of that Enlightenment phase. So consider this kind of part one, and we'll return to it in part two uh, when we discuss in greater detail Hume and uh, Kant's uh, response to empirical thinking. So that's pretty well it. So I will see you uh, hopefully Monday afternoon. Hopefully you have a chance to look at this before we meet on Monday. So take care and we'll see you in a couple of days.